Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Rice Booth, and I am the Chief Access and Equi Equity Officer at the Leadership Academy, and I'm serving as your moderator um, this afternoon for some great learning and conversation. Um, I want to first recognize the land on which I'm taking space on um, in Austin, Texas. This is thank you to the Jamato and Tekankwanan tribes. A few housekeeping items before we dive in. Um, on the bottom of your screen, there'll be two buttons that'll be important for you to, to um, see. First is a chat button. We'll be using that to um, share some resources along the way. Um, and there's also a Q&A button. So if you have any questions for our esteemed speakers throughout our conversation, please feel free to put those questions in there. Um, and then we will create some space at the end of our conversation to ask a couple of them. All right, so let's first welcome um, our speakers for today, um, all folks who are um, noted leaders in the education space who really are uh, are embodying culturally responsive leaders um, personally, professionally, um, and in the systemic work that they're doing. Um, first, John King Jr. is a president and CEO of the, of the Education Trust and former Secretary of Education under the Obama administration. We have Susanna Cordova, who is a superintendent of, ten, of Denver Public Schools. Um, and in that role, she's working tirelessly to ensure that every student is successful um, in a supportive environment um, by design and not by accident, which I love that. Um, and finally, we have Nancy Gutierrez, um, who is the president and CEO of the Leadership Academy, um, who was formerly an award-winning teacher and principal in her hometown of East San Jose, California. And you have all of those bios in the chat for you. So before we dive into our conversation, I want to give you a little bit of context on what brought us here today. 18 years ago, the then mayor and chancellor of New York City decided that they wanted to cultivate a different type of principal. They also wanted to ensure that the principals that were in our, the largest public school system in the country were reflective of the students that are walking into their doors every day. Then at that time, the New York City Leadership Academy and our aspiring principals program was born. Since then, we've been working with aspiring principals, superintendents, school boards, State Department of Education, across 36 states. And the results of that depth and breadth of our work, we realized that we had to change our name. So uh, we took out the New York City um, and the NICLA, the um, acronym that so many of you use to describe us, we uh, changed that and we are now the Leadership Academy. And with that rebrand, we also recognize is that we need to really tighten and, and define our language and the, our pursuit, as you see from our vision and mission, to building systems um, that were intentionally built for the students um, in our school, public school system, um, that we had to de define that language. And then we also wanted to make sure that the pathway to get to equity was culturally responsive leaders. And so our definition of a culturally responsive leader is someone who recognizes the impact of institu institutionalized racism on their own lives and the lives of the students and families they work with and embraces their role in mitigating, disrupting, and dismantling systemic oppression. Now, how do you do that? That's where our leadership actions come about. And we decided that uh, we wanted to make sure that these leadership actions was clear from aspiring principal all the way through to superintendent. Um, and that really helped um, a leader embody what it meant to be a culturally responsive leader. This is not a silver bullet. This is not a yellow brick road. However, this is a characteristics um, and qualities that a leader can um, take on um, in their journey. So if we break down that definition of culture responsive leader, that first part about recognizing yourself and who you are, you can lean on the actions leading for equity and access and engaging in personal learning and development. That second part of the definition that is focused in on really wrapping your, hand, your arms around the students and the families and community in which you serve, you can lean on um, aligning mission, vision, and core values and the cultivating community care and engagement. And when you're ready to mitigate and disrupt the inequities that you're seeing in, the, in your everyday practice, then we have plenty of actions for you to lean on. You can focus on instruction, facilitating adult learning and development, managing operation and resources, and strategic chain, change and continuous improvement. 
And so again, access to this framework is available to you in the chat. So now we want to jump into our, our questions um, and be able to really hear from John, Suzanne, and Nancy about their experiences um, in cultivating culturally responsive leaders um, in within the um, systems and uh, uh, systems and schools that they are have worked with. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with a. a somewhat personal question is, what's your why? Why is it that you all um, are doing the work that you're doing on an everyday basis? I'll start. Hi everyone, good to be here. Um, good to see you, John Susana. Thank you so much for being here with us, Mary, thank you. Um, you know, my why has always been my family, my familia, my community um, of East San Jose, California. You know, big, beautiful, humble Mexican American community. Um, that despite how amazing uh, we are, we've always been underestimated because of who we are. And that's always really grown a fire in my belly uh, to, to, um, to change that perception to do right by our community. Now, my why has shifted, you know, as we're watching our next generation of, of children, of youth grow. Um, and I wanted to quickly show, share a story of my niece Amaya as part of my, my why. Uh, and if we can put the picture up, Lindsay. But so Amaya is a third grader in um, a pub public school in California's East Bay. And a couple weeks ago, so she's doing, you know, all online learning, remote learning. And a couple weeks ago, um, my sister, her mother notices that she has, uh, you know, she has a post-it reflection on her computer. Uh, and we'll show you the picture right now shortly. Um, and so she has a post-it reflection on her computer and it reads, Black Lives Matter. And so my sister goes over uh, and she asks her, she says, hey, Maya, can you, you know, can you share more about, uh, about this picture? And so Maya explains, you know, I'm learning about segregation. I'm learning about equal rights, you know, and she says, I want to live in a world where Black Lives Matter doesn't exist. And my sister says, can you say more about that? Because, you know, that could go either way. You know, <laughs> Maya, what are you talking about? And Maya says, well, it wouldn't exist because uh, and we wouldn't have to say it because we would all know it and we would all show it. Uh, now, she then picks up her arm, looks down at her arm and says, and mommy, I'm black. And I can imagine that there's a lot of thoughts circling through your head right now. What did Amaya mean by that? Amaya is half Mexican, half Filipino. And it created a lot of questions uh, for me about extensions that were made or not made as part of this learning uh, that she had in class. You know, was she being empathetic? Was she standing in solidarity? Was she being forced into the binaries that we adults force upon our youth? You know, did she not have the language to say, I'm a person of color too? You know, was she engaging in her own identity exploration? Um, so, you know, when I think about my why, I think about making sure that the experience that happened in our classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis gives students um, like Amaya the language, the access, the extensions to learning in order to make meaning of the content, to explore her racial, ethnic, cultural identity, to build on her curiosities. Uh, because in our early grades, our kids are forming their identity, their biases, their curiosities. Um, you know, it's what Gloria Letts and Billings would refer to as our socio, you know, their socio cultural or socio or critical consciousness. Um, you know, what does it mean for the teacher to enact culturally responsive practices in that moment? What does that then mean for what the principal needs to know and be able to do? What does that mean then for the principal supervisor and what that person needs to know and be able to do and then the superintendent? And so my why is about helping to draw that through line uh, so that we can create that those experiences uh, for our children on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom. Great. Well, I'm happy to jump in and share my why as well. And thank you, Nancy, for sharing that story. Um, and um, I, I want to talk a little bit about my own personal experiences. Um, as a student, I'm uh, the superintendent in my hometown. So I went to school in my school district. And I've worked my um, entire adult career uh, inside Denver Public Schools. And when I was a student in DPS, um, I feel like I got a great academic education. But it really wasn't until uh, I was in college where I happened to stumble across a book of Chicano literature that I was able to ever see anything that connected to my family, my culture, my roots. Um, in written word. And I frankly had spent a lot of my childhood um, hearing messages about um, the importance of getting an education to get out of your neighborhood. Like, that was what teachers told me all the time. Um, and they would tell me things like, oh, you're such a great student. You're not like all the other kids. Um, and so certainly I internalized a lot of those messages as your neighborhood's not a good place to be, so get out of it. 
And don't be like the people that look like you, including the people in your family, um, be a, something better than that. Um, and it really wasn't until I was, uh, you know, a junior in college when uh, I was finally able, like in a book of um, kind of like esoteric uh, English literature that was dedicated to Chicano poetry that I finally saw something um, that felt validating in an academic setting. And it was at that moment I decided I wanted to become a teacher. And I spent, you know, my career in the classroom um, and in schools um, really um, working to ensure that kids could see themselves. But what has been so striking to me as a systems leader is how even with all of that effort and energy, even with tremendous work, for example, to make sure that we have language um, equity um, in our resources, that materials are available in multiple languages, that we value that, that it still is um, in many cases an accident that kids get exposed to seeing themselves in their curriculum. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of our district. Uh, we are working very hard to change that. We just recently passed a resolution um, at our school board uh, that we call the No Justice, No Peace, but it's K-N-O-W, so that if you know justice, you will know peace. Um, and it really is about ensuring that it is part of every student's experience in our district to engage in culturally responsive curriculum with educators who have been trained um, to deliver that in a culturally responsive way. Um, and so we are looking at all of our core classes um, for revisions. We are including more opportunities for um, ethnic studies uh, that are graduation credit bearing courses, not electives, uh, to completely reshape what it means to experience um, education in the Denver Public Schools so that we don't have it be the accident that people see themselves reflected in what they're learning. Well, thanks for that question and honored to be here and be a part of this conversation. You know, I, I think about this question of the why on sort of two levels. One, the, the why of sort of why I became a teacher and why I'm, I've spent my career in education has really been defined by my own experience in school. Um, both my parents were New York City public school educators their whole lives. Um, and so I grew up hearing about school. My mom was actually a school counselor in my elementary school. Um, but they couldn't have known the difference that school would make in my life. They both um, passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And in the period in between, it's just my dad and me. My dad was sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this environment that was unstable and inconsistent and a lot of times scary. Uh, I didn't know what my father would be like from one night to the next. And the thing that saved me during that period was that school was consistent and nurturing and supportive. And I had just powerful relationships with phenomenal New York City public school teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose. And, you know, my one teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Mr. Osterweil, I'm still in touch with him. He just created this classroom space that was amazing. We read the New York Times every day. We did productions of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and Alice in Wonderland. And the experiences in his classroom uh, allowed me to be a kid at school when I couldn't be a kid at home. And even after my dad passed and I moved around different family members, different schools, it was always teachers who helped give me a sense of hope about the future. So that drove me to become a teacher. And I still every day think about the difference that school made for me and see my work as bound up with trying to make sure that schools do that for all kids. Now, of course, all of that uh, so I think about on that level, but I also think about the level of how do, how do we stay resolute in the midst of all the challenges that we have right now, which can feel so overwhelming. And there I try to draw inspiration from our ancestors. Um, I had the experience uh, recently, in the last couple of years, of coming to learn a lot about my family history. And... Um, one of the things that, I, that we discovered in our family, I live about 25 miles from where my 
great grandfather was enslaved. And it uh, turns out that the folks who own the property where my great grandfather was enslaved are direct line descendants of the people who owned my family. And they still live on the property. The property has been maintained almost exactly like 1863. When you walk onto the property, it's like you're transported in time. And the cabin uh, where my great grandfather and his family lived in slavery, um, still standing on the property. And so I've had an opportunity to, to stand in that cabin to get to know this family. And I think often about him and his family and how they lived for a future they could not see, right? That they persevered with this hope for a whole set of future possibilities. It would have been unimaginable to them, the thought that, uh, you know, that his great-grandson would serve in the cabinet of the first African-American president living 25 miles from where he was enslaved, right? But that sense of uh, living for future generations and faith in the long term is what I try to draw strength from in this moment of all these challenges and think like 50 years from now, what will people look back and say about us and how we lived and what we did and how we approach this moment and just hope that we can um, try to leave a legacy of progress towards justice. Um, and that, that's, that's part of why I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation because ultimately that is what I see this as a conversation about. Thank you so much, John. I, I, I was transported there um, to your, and being next to you and, and, and um, your experience of learning about your ancestors. And I really appreciate um, Nancy and Susanna also you all sharing your stories as well. And I think you just, you embody the fact that this work is in your own story and your own experience um, and being able to really tap into that personal experience to be able to, to lead forward and to move forward. And so um, thank you for starting us off with such powerful stories. Um, I wanna move to our next question. Um, and, and John, you, you, um, you kind of, you're leading us there in the, the fact of our current context, right? Um, so COVID um, really shined a light on a lot of things that we, we all already knew, right? Um, but it really shined a light on that. Um, our racial reckoning that we're in the midst of also shined a light on things that we already knew. Um, so I'm curious to hear, what, are, what do you feel like are, are the persistent um, injustices and inequities that you're seeing um, in our school systems um, that we need to be laser focused in on? I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna ask Susanna first if you wanna start us off. I, yeah, no, thank you. You know, I think um, it's interesting, especially within the context of the pandemic that we're experiencing around healthcare. Um, it has just become so glaringly clear that the inequities in our school system are, you know, intricately entangled with the inequities that we experience in housing, in healthcare, in um, economics, um, and in the widening income gap. Um, and so I, I want to share, and like, I don't think this will surprise anybody who's working in a school right now. So we are cautiously beginning to reopen for in-person instruction, something that I have really, really advocated for when it's safe. Um, and as I look at our COVID numbers inside our schools, um, it absolutely overlaps with our neighborhoods that are most impacted. The neighborhoods that are most impacted absolutely overlap with the families that have opted out of in-person instruction at the highest levels. And by our own surveys and what our students tell us, our Black and Latinx students dislike remote learning more than our white students. And so it's like this perfect storm. Their neighborhoods are not safe and healthy. They don't feel safe coming into school because of the higher rates of COVID and they experience remote learning um, as a less adequate way to learn. And um, I think we know uh, for many of our students, the collectivist approach to learning is such an enabler, and it is so much more challenging um, in our communities um, of color uh, right now. And even things like um, the, the strength of cellular service in certain neighborhoods so that hotspots actually don't function as well when we can get them. We've closed the device gap 
but we need to close the gaps in all of these other spaces that absolutely play out in the ability of our students um, to be able to learn in meaningful ways, um, particularly at a time like this. John, you wanna add on to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, Susanna's exactly right. I, you know, I, I think part of what I, what I hope we can convey to folks is that this COVID crisis has exacerbated the inequities that existed before. And so our moral responsibility is to do more than just go back to how it was pre-COVID. Because I, I hear a lot of sort of like, when we get back to normal, well, the pre-COVID normal is not good enough, right? And I don't want to sign up for that. I want us to look at, you know, why is it that low-income students and students of color had less access to quality early childhood education? Why is it that we had huge resource equity gaps where, as we've shown in, in Ed Trust in our work, you know, you have $2,000 per student difference between what's spent in the districts that serve them, the fewest students of color versus those that spend, that, that serve the most students of color. And, you know, that $2,000 gap in many parts of the country is three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar difference in what's spent, and that means different different level of access to uh, the strongest teachers, different level of access to advanced coursework, different level of access to art and music, different level of access to school counselors. We have 1.6 million kids pre-COVID who went to a school where there was a law enforcement officer and no school counselor. Who wants to go back to that? So right. So so I think the the, the challenge is. How do we both say COVID has had this awful, disparate impact, and that is on top of these glaring disparities? And how do we then mobilize a kind of a movement to build a future that is substantially more equitable than what came before? Oh, definitely. We don't want to go back to that at all. I agree. <laughs> right. Um, and moral responsibility. Right. I think that's a, a key phrase for us to, to hold on to. Right. Um, that we and that we're all responsible for that. Um, so I want to really think about the the leader. Right. So us as the Leadership Academy, that's our, our primary lover that we pull um, as a device in order to get to to the to to address these inequities and get to the equitable systems that we're talking about. Um, so um, I'm going to pass this, um, send this to you, Nancy, first. So what can a, a culturally responsive leader do in order to disrupt the inequities uh, that Susanna and John just uh, named for us? Well, I think, I think we have, there's two parallel paths, right? There's a self and the system that we have to constantly go back and we can't get stuck in either, right? We get too stuck in self and doing the inner work that we never get to application. Uh, and sometimes we get too stuck in the system that we never hold up the mirror to ourselves, right? So we have to stay kind of on those parallel paths. And we had shared um, a, 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 our culturally responsive leadership actions at the very beginning. I'd love for those to be put into the chat again, because what you'll notice that regardless of the level of leader, if you're looking at the aspiring principal, if you're looking at the principal soup, if you're looking at the superintendent, the very first action is around what it means to lead for equity and access. And we divide that by six different dispositions. Um, now, you'll, if you click on that, just a warning, it's like 85 pages. So be careful because we want you to stay with us here in this room and in this conversation. But you'll notice that those, those six different actions, and I just what I want to do is just briefly uh, go through each one of them um, so that just to give you a sense. So the first one is around doing the inner work, right? And this work is lifelong work. We're in, and you cannot wait until you arrive to move to the second disposition, right? Which is around what does it mean to take that inner work, to take those beliefs and values and actually publicly share them. As a leader, when you publicly share your beliefs, you free others up to do the same. You create the conditions. Now you see the way, you know, the way Susanna and the way that John, like just they, they share the beliefs so publicly that, that I can't only imagine what that means for your teams you know, who work um, side by side with you, who feel like they can also share their, value, their values in a public ways. And mind you, I know it's not easy. I know that that second disposition, it seems, it sounds simple. It's actually very political. It's very political and it takes quite a bit of skill in navigating the space of what it means to, to, to share those beliefs um, around anti-racism, around equity. Uh, and the third disposition we think about is like, what does it mean to take your inner work Take what you're sharing publicly and then check yourself in the moment to moment decision making as you engage in your job, 
right? Like, what does it mean to know like how your lived experiences color your lens to lead, right? And so that's what the third disposition is all about. The fourth, we go into thinking about what does it mean to build the capacity of others? In leadership, we have these myths around the superhero. And in fact, there's a lot of interest around like getting attention and being the person who does this and that. And, and this work is not about that. If we're thinking about creating a more democratic, equitable society, it has to be done with teams. And it has to be done in a way that actually builds the capacity of others around us to do this work really effectively. Uh, so the fourth is around. The fifth is around uh, confronting inequities when we see them. Now, to do that, we have to know how to identify them. So if we haven't sharpened our lens, how do we know what they actually are in order to confront them and name them? Now, I want to be really clear here, which is that, uh, you know, and I'm, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the hood. So <laughs> I'm just going to be really clear about the word confrontation, confront. Confront does not mean confrontation. Confront means that you are naming, you're asking good questions, you are bringing to surface harmful inequities that may not otherwise be named. And if you are in that space and you see something or hear something and you walk away, you are essentially condoning what is happening within that space. And again, it doesn't mean that it has to be some big ordeal, but it means you have to name it. It means you have to ask questions. Uh, and then the sixth disposition that we, that we share and that we, we um, ask leaders to enact as part of what it means to lead for equity is, um, is shifting systems and structures. You know, that sounds very cliche to say that, but, but the point is that leaders turn over at very rapid rates. And because of that, you got to make sure that this work is for the long term, that these systems will outlive you, that it is not about your ego. It's not dependent on you being in that seat, but that the systems over time will outlive you. And so those are just six ways to think about what it means to actually enact leadership. What can people observe in your behaviors to know that you are leading for equity? And that's what, that's what uh, we wanted to lay out in the dispositions that you'll see uh, in, that, in that framework. Suzanne and John, do you want to share what you've seen in Denver and, or in New York? Well, I just, the, the, I, I love those dispositions. And the thing that I would, I would urge us to do in this moment, both as leaders reflecting on our own role and as leaders reflecting on the systems of which we are a part, is to sort of challenge folks, confront in that positive sense, <laughs> challenge folks to align their actions and their espoused values. Um, you know, James Baldwin had this thing he would say, uh, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And so I think about this spring and all these school districts and foundations and corporations and higher ed institutions that put out statements of solidarity with Black Lives Matter. But then the, the substance has not followed, right? So you say Black Lives Matter, but you don't have Black teachers, right? You say Black Lives Matter, but you suspend uh, Black girls at five times the rate of white girls in your school district. You say Black Lives Matter, but when I walk down the hallway, I see in the AP class, white students, and I see in the remedial class, Black and Latino students, right? And so there is this, I think, moment where part of uh, the leadership challenge is, is kind of bridging that, that gap. Um, because every, I think there is, there is this real genuine desire to be anti-racist, but we have to translate in, that into anti-racist action. Uh, you know, we need to replace performative wokeness with policy wokeness, right? <laughs> Where we actually do the things differently. Um, so I'll just add a little bit on. So, um, you know, I started my superintendency just about 18 months ago. It's uh, been a uh, uh, very um, different time, I think, to step into the superintendency um, in public education in our country right now. Um, but one of the things I was very committed to doing was creating a different environment to be able to have conversations that are challenging conversations. Um, and the mantra that I used as I stepped in was that whenever we have a choice, we need to ask, will this break the historic patterns of inequity, not by accident, but by design? And um, one of the things that we've been very focused on this year is trying to create space where we actually can talk about what are the characteristics of white supremacy culture? In what ways do we knowingly or unknowingly 
continue practices and what are some of the specific antidotes that we can um, use to combat that and how do we do that intentionally? How do we do that um, and take ownership? How do we acknowledge um, when um, we make mistakes because we do? Um, and how do we create more space for this conversation to happen um, with the people who are most impacted by white supremacy culture? Um, and it's been tough. Um, you know, in any large school district, there are lots and lots and lots of things that we need to work on. Um, and this idea of, um, you know, a sense of urgency and perfectionism, and I got to do this all by myself to get it done. Those are all of the things that we feel like um, intentionally or unintentionally perpetuate a, a condition where people don't have a voice, where their perspectives can't be heard, where we can't make the best decisions. Um, and so it's tough. It, like there are these tensions that we feel all the time about this. But I think we are creating a different environment for the conversation at least to happen. Mary, can I add just one thing to what Susanna just said? You know, it, it's reminding me that it's, it's like the willingness to have the vulnerability to say, I don't know how to do this. It, we need that so desperately. And, you, and you're right, part of white supremacy culture is this individualism aspect. And it's like, you know, you... So you've arrived on your own, you're competent, you're this and you're that. But the truth is, is that we, if we are effective leaders, we actually don't have all the answers. And we're willing to say that and we're willing to engage in the conversation. And this work around anti-racism and around creating equitable systems is not easy. If it were easy, we'd have equitable systems. We don't have equitable systems. We don't have equitable practices. And, and what that essentially means is that we all need help getting there. So I just love you saying that because I think there's just like this myth and this false like, you know, understanding that we have to have all the answers as leaders and we frankly don't and shouldn't. Thank you for that. I think the, the vulnerability part of this work as leaders um, is so critical, right? Um, so again, going back to our first question about it starts with yourself and having that, that story um, and then really understanding that um, you, this is a collective journey, right? You may be the leader, but you need to, to bring the community with you. Um, so let's get to some policy wokeness. Um, that's our, uh, fi our final question. I'm going to, again, um, plug. Um, we have some, we will have time for some Q&A after this question. So if you have any questions for any of our um, speakers, please um, put that um, in the bottom of your screen. Um, so what policies, um, uh, local, state, national, do you really feel like we need to examine, um, re-examine, rework, throw out the window um, in order to actually have that equitable systems um, that you all are speaking of? Do you want to get us started, John? Sure. I mean, it's a question of like, how long do you have? There's no, <laughs> thing, right? there's no like, there's no silver bullet. There's like many, many things. But you know, I think it starts with um, resource equity and closing the resource equity gap, right? And that's in early childhood. You know, we, in the wealthiest country in the world, we should have universal access to high quality early childhood education. And that's not just pre-K, although pre-K is hugely important. That's really zero to four. Um, we ought to have equitable resources in our schools. So our schools serving the highest needs students need actually more resources to address those needs. Right. And so when we look at state funding formulas or how districts distribute their resources, what we should see is more resources going to the places where kids are facing the most significant challenges. We need, I think, in this moment to rethink teaching and learning in some really uh, foundational ways. You know, I, I think of it as kids need to have windows and mirrors. They need to have opportunities to see worlds beyond their own, but they also need to see themselves reflected. And the authors they read and the stories that are centered in the, in the texts that they read, in the history that we tell. You know, we have to tell an honest history about the role of systemic racism in our history, but we also need to help all students see examples of Black excellence, Latino excellence, Native American excellence, Asian American excellence. Uh, we need teacher diversity. Majority of kids in the nation's public schools are kids of color. Only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. Um, we need to rethink our approach to discipline and say, how do we create environments in schools that are characterized by love and support? 
right, as opposed to uh, our reliance on exclusionary discipline or the crazy fact that we have more than 15 states that still allow corporal punishment that think that somehow it is in, it is in society's interest or kids' interest for adults to commit state-sanctioned violence against them, right? So, and we need to, we need to have a plan for how we make sure that all kids have access to post-secondary opportunity. Now, that may not be a four-year degree for everybody. Maybe it's associate's degree. Maybe it's uh, really strong career training. But again, it, in the wealthiest country in the world, we ought to have a plan that ensures that every person has the opportunity to have a uh, meaningful, fulfilling life that they can afford to feed themselves and their family. And you know, I guess I would say fundamentally, we need to transform how we think about our society from uh, like what's in it for me kind of frame to, uh, you know, what's best for us as a community and how do, we, how do we invest in every kid the way we invest in our own. And that, that's, that's a cultural transformation, not just a policy transformation. Um, I, I think John really captured so much of uh, what we need to look at. Um, the one thing that I will share is um, I am having sort of an internal extended argument with myself around um, the role of testing uh, in our current environment. Um, and certainly one of the things I think is really important to name is um, I think it's critically important that we continue to hold out high expectations um, for our students um, as we are thinking about the role uh, of being an educator and, you know, as a first generation um, college graduate, first in my family to graduate from college, um, I definitely know that absent the support I got in school, there's no way I would be sitting where I am today um, and how critically important it is that we do hold up, out high expectations for our students um, because not like my parents didn't love me, they just didn't have experience to be able to do that. So I think it's critically important. And I think at the same time, uh, it's really important that we rethink um, the role that uh, testing has played in our schools um, and in our communities. Um, and that we need to do that in some way where it's like, um, how do we you know, continue to focus on the upsides and minimize the downsides? that we currently have in our either or environment. Um, and I, it's not at all that I don't think there's a role, um, but I am finding myself asking more questions about what that role is, how we use that information, what we do with it. And particularly during this pandemic, I think it's critically important that we're focusing on what we're doing at the local level, most importantly. Thank you for that, Susanna and John. Um, I want to um, transition to our questions that we have um, coming in from folks. Um, and I saw a, a couple of questions around really supporting um, leaders um, and districts that are predominantly white. Um, and so how do you have start, start having that conversation? Um, I actually was just with a group of uh, principal supervisors this morning and really um, recognizing that this work about culture responsive practice isn't just about black and brown kids, right? And black and brown, but it gets for everyone um, and the importance of that we all, um, diversity supports and everyone. Um, so how do we, um, how do you start having and engaging a conversation um, with a district um, that is predominantly white? Um, they may not see um, or fully embodying um, the need um, to, to step into this conversation. I'll jump in just to say that I think that I think, first of all, I think everyone's entry point is going to be different based on context, based on the experience of, you know, and, you know, it's, it's back to this debate around beliefs or practices, where do we enter the conversation. Uh, and, uh, you know, and in some cases, we have to engage and show practices that are actually that are working that that can bring people to a level of understanding. A lot of the fear is around not understanding what this actually means. We use all this language, anti-racist, equity, white supremacy culture. And a lot of it is because it's so convoluted, so rhetoric based that people don't actually, they, it's not tangible enough for people to understand what it means within their context. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do think though that whether you enter through the space of beliefs or the space of practices, if you don't hit beliefs, it will not be sustainable. 
for that individual or for the system itself. And so I, I, I will offer that, that it's a continuum and you have to start where you start, but you cannot ignore the fact that we have to really hold up the mirror and look at our own beliefs and what brings us into those spaces. Can I maybe make a provocative observation that uh, Charlottesville was a SEL failure for white kids, right? That, that when you see the young white folks marching across that campus, torches in hand, chanting racist slogans. That that is that is a that is a failure. We have to do something different so that we don't have that result. And I wear that the SEL conversation sometimes gets framed as being about like fixing kids of color as opposed to fixing systems. And the systems are a problem for kids of color and for white kids because the systems are racist systems and we have to dismantle them, right? So, you know, I think we have to think about how do we support all kids in learning skills like perspective taking, right? In uh, being critical thinkers about interrogating how power and resources are distributed in our society. Those aren't just things we need to do for some kids, that's for all kids. Everybody should read Toni Morrison, right? That shouldn't just be the, that kids of color read Toni Morrison. Everybody needs to, to read Toni Morrison. Everybody uh, needs to have the experience of learning about reconstruction and the effort after the Civil War to tr produce real subs substantive equality and the way that was dismantled and, and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the implementation of Jim Crow. Like, that, that's not some kids need that lesson. All of, if, if all of us understood more of those things, maybe we would have a more just society, right? If, if all kids in American schools had learned about Japanese American internment, maybe we wouldn't have had uh, the Muslim ban, right? Because we, we were reenacting this horrible lesson from our history because we didn't learn it. And so how do we think about our responsibility um, to prepare the next generation to have a successful multiracial democracy. And to add, I wanna go on the, sorry, go ahead Nancy. Just the 30 second, you know, you're also making me think that it's important to, uh, to break down and define what whiteness actually means because Glenn Singleton would frame it as, you know, color culture consciousness that we're not just talking about, that people of color too, even with our lived experiences have to embrace what we enact that is harmful to our own people and to our own communities. And so I think that's also an angle that, that can help, I think, bring others into the fold and willingness to do the work. I wanna to go to the um, other side, right? We're, we're all here as, as Black and Latinx, Latinx leaders um, and um, you know, leaders that may have been um, one of the few in our, in our spaces. Um, and there are a lot of other um, Black, Indigenous and, and Latinx people of color who are also in leadership roles or being asked to take on um, this new work around DEI, even though that's not what they studied and then not their background. So how do we support um, our, 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 our fellow leaders of color um, in this space and in this time and place who um, may feeling an extra, an extra burden um, and leading this work in, the, in this move towards creating equitable school systems? Um, I can talk a little bit about our experience um, here in Denver. Uh, we spent this past year uh, doing a year long course of study that we called the equity experience. It was really intended and designed to be a personal journey. And so the accountability for it was you have to do it. Um, and so we tracked um, everybody um, who was enrolled in it. And the, there were nine modules that we did over uh, probably about 12 or 13 months. Um, but it really was intended to be like you as an individual know where you are, read and engage with um, these articles, watch these videos, keep a journal. Um, and I was a little skeptical at the front end on whether or not it was going to have sort of like a stickiness to it for our organization. Um, all of the modules we created internally, we had people within our teams um, who um, were the narrators who compiled the information. Um, and it's been incredibly powerful. It was powerful for me to experience. I did all of the modules. 
Um, I think it was powerful for our teams to experience. And it started to create some common language, particularly for people, um, to, regardless of where you entered in. It started to create some common language for people to have conversations about this. It's frankly how we were able to start having conversations about what are characteristics of white supremacist culture. Um, it gave us the ability to start examining our practices in a way um, that maybe was a little bit more initially at an arm's length, but allowed people to go significantly deeper. Um, and so it's been a really powerful um, tool that we've used in Denver. We're starting to use it with school teams this year. Just, I'd just add that, you know, I think we have to take, take care of folks, you know, that there's, that there's a, a sort of a mental and emotional and spiritual exhaustion that can come from sort of championing these issues all the time. And like, we have to figure out how to, you know, some, sometimes say to folks like, hey, you know, it's time for some self-care and like be the friend that makes that point to someone. We have to do that with ourselves. And, and, uh, and I think we have to create um, spaces uh, where folks can share their experience. So I think about, you know, my kids are in Montgomery County Schools here in Maryland. There's a project called the Bond Project, which started as just an effort to help uh, at first African-American male teachers just get together and talk and share experiences and just have a space to process the experience that they were having. You know, only 2% of our teachers as a country are African-American men. So there, there's a need for those, for those kinds of spaces. And uh, creating that, I think, is, is a leadership service to, to try to help people um, navigate this moment. Thank you. Um, so we are going to move um, in our space of wrapping up. I'm gonna actually um, turn it to Nancy um, to tell us where do we need to go from here? It's a big question. <laughs> you know, I think this, it's been such a great conversation uh, and I think, I think so much has been said around the, these two parallel paths of system and self, right? And this deep introspection, I think this work requires, and also our job as leaders to make this work tangible. Yeah, you know, people can grab onto it and engage with it, understand it. A lot of the fear, again, is around not understanding what it actually is, what it means, and not willing to be vulnerable. I do, though, I do think, though, that we should caution ourselves with some common mistakes that are made. I think I think it's in some ways, sometimes we overestimate our competency to lead this work. Uh, and so we always need support. We need our personal kitchen cabinet. We need our professional you know, colleagues to reach out to and to support us to do this well. We also underestimate the time and effort this work requires. I mean, even you know, with our work, the Leadership Academy internally, you know, we're, we're trying to do internally what we do externally. And it is very hard. It is not easy. And it's, it's, a, lot, it's, a, it's a long journey and we have to be prepared for that. This requires a lot of stamina. I also, I also think we assume that everyone is ready or willing to discuss these issues. Uh, and, um, and we have to be, you know, we have to have the stamina to engage in conversations when we know it's not going to, you know, that it's going to take a lot of emotional labor on our end as we engage in this process. Uh, and, um, and finally, I think we, we do it in incoherent silos. Right, often creating confusion for the end goal. And so, Susanna, I've been loving what you've been talking about in Denver around, it sounds like there's all these different coherent, you know, these very intentional ways to create coherence around racial literacy and, you know, equitable literacy to, in order to make sure that, that folks are speaking a common language and moving in the same direction. And, and too often we do it, you know, uh, separate. And so I, I think, you know, the through line here is always important. It's always important to do our work to make sure we can draw who we are as leaders, our role in the system directly to Amaya's third grade classroom, right? And we have to always think about that through line because we're not in this business folks to just create better people. That's a great thing that we're doing for ourselves and for the world, but we are educators in this space to also make sure that whatever we are doing for ourselves is actually impacting uh, our schools and our classrooms directly. Thank you. Any final words, um, John and Susanna? Well, just we are with. I want one, two quick things. One is so grateful to Susanna for her leadership in Denver, and I, I, you know, I, Susanna and I are part of this community of superintendents that get together periodically, and I just 
so admire the incredible leadership. And in the absence of federal leadership, uh, it's been local leaders who have had to step up to grapple with these huge challenges. And so I just want to appreciate Susanna. And then I want to appreciate all the folks who are on this call because folks are saving lives every day in the relationships they have with students in the work that they're doing to ensure students have access to opportunity. So uh, just so incredibly grateful for how educators are stepping into the breach in this really challenging moment for our health and well-being as a society and the health and well-being of our democracy. Um, I, I think I would say I've been looking at some of the comments in the chat um, and there's a really robust conversation going on there. I feel like I feel like I want to go to that session as well as this session <laughs> while I look at the, the uh, comments going back and forth in the chat. Um, and one of the things that I would share, um, and Nancy, thank you for your kind words. You know, we have um, over time been both kind of all over the place and more and more getting uh, greater coherence. And so I would definitely say you, you have to be where you are and you have to continue to push and move forward um, in this work. Um, I, I would also say just uh, as a comment um, on some of what's in the chat, it really does take all of us. And um, you happen to have leaders of color who are speaking here, but I know in our district, we wouldn't be where we are if white leaders weren't stepping up in the exact same way. Um, and um, or in similar ways, uh, you know, willing to name and confront their own biases, um, their own examples of white privilege. Um, and to get to that point, you really do have to create a space, um, and it doesn't happen overnight, where people can openly and honestly have these conversations. Um, and um, it has been an evolution for sure. Um, but we talk all the time about like, it's a journey, it's not a destination. Um, and we are all traveling this journey together um, and how important it is for us to stay focused on that. So much. Um, John, you have provided us so many great um, quotes um, and words to live by um, during our time together. Susanna, I think everybody wants your equity excellence modules and wants to hear more about them. Um, and Nancy, thank you so much for providing us some concrete strategies and tools as well um, for leaders. Um, so I really appreciate the time that you took in, in bringing us together. And thank you for everybody that's um, um, also having conversations in the chat as well. Before we let you go, uh, we want to be able to give you a glimpse into how um, culture responsive leadership has looked um, beyond Denver um, and in, in two of the districts um, that we have worked closely with in the past couple of years. Um, so we're gonna give you, show you a, a quick clip into a documentary that we pulled together that highlights our work um, in Des Moines Public Schools um, and Lexington County One District, which is in South Carolina. And just as we're setting that up, just note that this documentary by Visionaries is on, um, you know, local stations throughout the fall. Uh, and so this is a two minute um, trailer that we'd love for you to watch with us. Um, and the full uh, uh, documentary is about 30 minutes. There are children in the most challenged communities in the world who can become Albert Einstein, given the opportunity. Every single person in this building is an educator. Every single person in this building is a trusted adult. Every single person in this building is a member of the team. This is the story of the Leadership Academy, a nonprofit organization founded in New York City that has emerged as a national model for teaching and inspiring leadership at every level of the school system. Today's students, today's population, we are shifting as a country demographically, and we have to think about what leadership means in today's context versus the way in which we experience schooling. We're not preparing leaders for the schools of yesterday. We're preparing leaders for the schools of tomorrow, and there will always be a, a tomorrow. Um, based on your local listings, um, this the full documentary is available on PBS. Um, so again, I want to um, thank everyone um, for your time today. Again, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, John. Thank you, Nancy, for all of your um, amazing words with us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, to, and to thank you, everyone, um, that they had the chance to come on um, this webinar this afternoon. Um, we appreciate you taking your time, um, and we are with you. Um, as you are all striving to become culturally responsive leaders um, in the district and organizations that you are working with um, and be well.
Thanks so much. Thank you all.